From the 2013 Spring Roundup, Keith Hughes and Wally Congdon, Understanding Energy Contracts. This is Wally Congdon and Keith Hughes, uh, both beef producers. We're very glad to have them. I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks. So this is a not a totally off the wall message. This is a different world, but this is something that's worth doing and that you need to hear. And I frankly wish there were a few more of you here. So the gig is real simple. Um, both of us raise cows for a significant part of what we do. Both of us do a really weird thing. Um, you're talking to two men who don't raise pounds. You're talking to two men who raise beef which is a different world. I like my cows a lot, not when they're slaughtered, not when they're butchered, not when they're harvested, as Ted Turner says. I like my cows a lot when they're retired, hanging around naked. And I have about 30 of them that way right now. They're just hanging around, naked, retired. I'm not mentioning to the people who are so concerned about it, that means they're on a meat hook in a locker plant age in 28 days each. But that's what it ought to be, and that's what Keith does too. So we both do other things otherwise. So Keith runs is the manager for Mike's oil field service out of Big Piney, that country part of Wyoming, and his specialty is not just the fact he's an egg science hyphen teacher in schools as well, he doesn't do that now, and he raises cows, but he specializes in reclamation of messes. When somebody takes all the stuff from a drilling rig, a gas well, whatever, this man has a huge dustpan and a huge broom. <laughs> what he does is clean up the wreck big time. What I do besides teach ag law and teach natural resources law for law school, undergraduate school, et cetera, and work for a lot of counties, sometimes the USDA, sometimes Canada, sometimes whoever, what I do as well is write language a lot of times for development for counties, for wind towers, cell towers, oil, gas, et cetera. So what we did is a presentation and an outline on simply put, for the guy that's out on the ground, which is all of you, that's not us, it's not your lawyer, it's not your consultant, it's not your whoever. The person on the ground who knows what's out there, what it is, is you in the field. So when a guy comes to talk about developing oil, developing gas, I want a cell tower here, you own the right ridge, who needs to know what goes in that equation is the guy they're talking to first. And that's not your lawyer, <clears throat> that's not your NRCS agent, that's not your land realtor. That is you. So that's the reason for the presentation and what we put in it, because where the rubber meets the road is what matters, and you are where that happens. So if Keith has nothing else to add to that, he has a PowerPoint. I am the techno antichrist, so to speak, <laughs> in the words of the state bar, but of Montana. But Keith has a good PowerPoint, and we did an outline for you. So I'll read you one paragraph of that before we start. The oil and gas boom combined with a national commitment to quote, green energy, whatever that is, and new communication technologies have all brought the rural west a multitude of new issues not considered before in the context of clean air, clean water, and wildlife. All these activities are heavily regulated by state and federal laws and sometimes by local laws as well. The applicability of these laws in public lands is stringent. Basically, you can't do anything on federal or state usually without a tremendous checklist of things to go through. Unfortunately, their application on private lands is less stringent and can often cause a private landowner significant stress, if not a long-term difficulty, which is the biggest issue. Our climate makes land sensitive throughout the Upper West. Where there's mountains, where there's hills, and there's basic desert, everything is sensitive. You drive a truck over it, in 20 years you can still tell. Tear the ground up with a plow in 50 years, you can still tell. Build a house in 75 years, the stone foundation is still there, you can still tell if the logs aren't. So it's delicate to restore as well as delicate to have. <clears throat> so our guidelines for how you do this include the following list, particularly for long-term improvements, modifications, or structures. And the reason we did it as an outline besides the PowerPoint is this is kind of a checklist for all of you to look at to say, when somebody's talking to me, what do we do in terms of this list? What should we talk about? So with that, I'll turn Keith loose with a PowerPoint to get us started. What I have here is a uh, here. PowerPoint. Basically, there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of type on it. Just triggers for me to talk about, and it's uh, from a person that's out working in the field every day. It was hard to take my coveralls and hard hat off to, to be in here today. 
my phone's ringing as we're sitting here. Um, a guy from in Canada down Riverton, they've just pulled the plug on the drilling program. He's asked us to come and clean their reserve pits, get rid of the waste. Where are the rigs going? They're off of federal ground and going to private ground. Under the current administration, it's very difficult to be on federal, federal land drilling. It's a lot harder. So most of the rigs that we're seeing are also chasing oil. They're going to North Dakota, which is mostly private. They're going to Colorado, Eastern Montana. Uh, oil companies that we work for are buying ranches and doing the drilling on them very responsibly still environmentally is what I've seen in the, in the federal lands. But it's a bigger concern now than it has been because they have nowhere else to go. They need to go to private. Uh, and there are opportunities um, working with these oil and gas companies managing their ranches. They want the irrigation rights sustained. They want animals grazing. And so there are some opportunities there. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> the oil fields of western Wyoming is what I'm going to focus on simply because that's where I'm at. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the oil and gas industry and what I do in it. Now we're going to talk about the risks associated with the energy development. What land risk do you need to be concerned, at, uh, concerned with as a producer? What kind of things can happen on the ground? Not on paper as you're mitigating before they come, but what can happen? And then I want you to understand that the energy industry is very proactive and trying very hard to be responsible and to protect what we have. Not used to all this fancy technology. <clears throat> so the United States, from the Gulf of Mexico up through Texas, Oklahoma, parts of Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, back through eastern Montana. If you could kind of make a big oval up through there. That used to be a shallow seabed, just an extension of the Gulf of Mexico. Because of that, there is oil, gas, coal, all sorts of energy, rich minerals, liquids that we, that we need in the United States. As you guys all know, we're energy consumers. Doesn't matter uh, what field you're in, you're consuming energy. In Wyoming, this basin right here is where I have been working. We had 60 to 70 drilling rigs. I would say 90% on public ground, 10% on private. We now have five or six rigs. They're over on this side of the state going after the oil. It's uh, more private over in this section or that section of the state on up through Montana. So that's where we're working. So Sublet County, just as a quick history of Sublet County, it's uh, been considered the Serengeti of the United States. It's very pristine. We have lots of different wildlife, kind of like you guys over here, an extension of the Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, and we're also energy rich. We have everything you can imagine, oil, gas, H2S, helium, coal, uranium. It's all there, competing for the uh, resources of the rivers and streams, the Wind River Range, the Wyoming Range. Lots of different wildlife, antelope, deer, elk, moose, grizzly bears, black bears, sage chicken, which all of us know now are very, have a lot of notoriety in the news, something that we need to protect. So, <clears throat> the energy industries develop, are uh, competing with these resources along with ranching. About all we have in Sublet County is ranching and energy. So quickly we'll go through the development process of how do we get the energy out of the ground and then I'm going to go through step by step and talk about the risks associated with each developmental phase. So basically, uh, it's all we're after is a small hole in the ground. That's all we need to get the natural gas, to get the oil. But to get that small hole, it takes roads, it takes building a pad, it takes fracking, all of these different things to, uh, to get it out of the ground. Well, the drilling process, if uh, I'm coming onto your land and I want to drill. There are several ways I can do it. I can set a pad right here, and go straight down. We can go down at an angle and directional drill for several miles. The technology is there now to, to make a radius. And so if you have a chunk of sagebrush that's not so productive, you'll have that right to encourage people to, to encourage the energy industry to drill sitting up on that spot instead of out in your best meadow, your hay meadows. So after the drilling process takes place, if they have found viable energy, then they need to go in and frack. And you guys have heard a lot about fracking, I suppose, right? Promised land and all these different things. 
kind of gives us a negative view of what it is. And I, I think the uh, biggest thing is right here, the groundwater versus the fracking. Are we creating fissures that are allowing chemicals and gases to enter our groundwater, to contaminate our groundwater? But that has to take place after the drilling, unless you're in an area where there's so much energy that it's just flowing naturally out of the pipes. But you know, we've got all the easy stuff, right? So now we're going after the hard stuff. Now this is where we need to start this. So here's, let me talk about our contribution real quick and then we'll okay. get back into those. So, so what I do as part of this oil and gas, mainly we handle waste. For instance, the call I just took right before class started, the guy uh, out of Riverton within Canna said, hey, we're done drilling. Now we've got all these pits, we need to clean them out. So there's oil-based mud, there's frac sand, there's all this waste in these pits. And so we go in, we pull that out of the ground, we either treat it through a chemical process where we convert the hydrocarbons to water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and bury it on site, or we transport it to a certified disposal pit. We also do excavation, trucking. We are the uh, first call for the state of Wyoming if a semi rolls or something out on the highway, we're the ones that go clean it up. Somebody rolls on your ranch, we're there, which uh, unfortunately we've done that a time or two. So environmental concerns, which tie back to the ranch land too, uh, we've got to think about the air, the water, soil, wildlife, fisheries, and your, your ranch land. It's got to sustain you. It's got to feed the cows. It's, it's got to make a living for you. These are a few pictures that I've gathered. Um, <clears throat> for instance, you know, that was a fire on the Falcon Station on the top left. Here we've got some air problems. Fracking's a huge concern uh, with the contaminated groundwater. Many of you probably heard about Pavilion and uh, the controversy down in Pavilion over contaminated groundwater. We have a lot of pristine rivers and streams that uh, sometimes we'll be drilling right next to them. And in Sublette County now, we have a huge ozone problem. Our air's uh, worse than that of Atlanta, Georgia on any given day in the winter, you know, and so a lot of concerns. So, pads, you know, this is a picture of the Jonah Field. And um, that's what it can look like. So if you have an area rich in oil and gas on your, on your properties, you could end up having several pads. Um, when they're finished, you've got a lot of tanks and things that are going to be left. And we'll get into this more too. Reserve pits. Where are they dumping the material? Animal migration. Spills. This is a spill that we had to go in and clean up and, uh, and put new dirt down. So there's all sorts of different environmental concerns. Trucks that are rolled. This was one of ours. It was on private property. We flipped it. Our uh, contents of that container, you can see, have spilled all over the place. It took us several thousands and thousands of dollars to clean it up to the landowner's satisfaction. And that was just one of two of them. We rolled this one last year due to poor road construction. And this was also on private property. Luckily, nothing spilled out of this particular load. So, and there are a lot of environmental laws, and I'm sure Wally can, will get into that too. So now we'll go into the energy development. Um, in a chronological order, we have first to build roads and well pads. Then the drilling comes in. After that is well completion then production and reclamation. And so at this point, we'll just kind of go through each one of these and talk about the different risks associated with each one. So a few examples of uh, pictures of road building. You know, the pads can vary in size from one acre to 10 acres, depending on what you would allow as a producer. But here are a list of risks, and I'll let Wally step in here too. So here's the way that part works, and this is what matters. That's the process you're going to go through when somebody comes and says, I want to lease a site, I want to lease your mineral rights, I want to buy them, I want to have them, I want to develop a site. Somebody comes and says, you've got great wind, look at Elk Mountain down by Laramie. Go up to the country at Harleton, that country north in central Montana. <clears throat> There's dozens, hundreds of wind towers, the same at Elk Mountain. Go look at the cell towers everywhere. I drove down from Billings yesterday. There's towers the whole way down all over the place. So before you build the tower, before you drill the well, before you put up the wind tower, before you drill the gas site, this is what you're doing, exactly. So rule one of the equation is on your sheet that I gave you the outline on. And I am dead serious when I say rule one is no driving cross country, period. 
And it's nothing against people with four wheelers or recreation or you chasing cows or whatever else. The problem's this, once somebody tears it up driving across your field on a nice fine spring day, it's 50 years to get rid of it, number one. And number two, before, besides that, what's on the bottom of their truck? Did it come from Oklahoma? How many weeds fell off? Did it come from Northern California? How many weeds fell off? Did it come from Washington? How many weeds fell off? Do you guys like yellow star thistle? You like leafy spurge? You like knapweed? You like Dalmatian toad flax? You like hound's tongue? Should I keep going? I think if you're not getting the message, what it is, is it's damn hard for Keith Hughes to come back later and fix this mess. And as the lawyer or the guy who's ranching, it's really hard to come back later and fix up the mess. Because one, preempt a lot of times for Keith, if they spill one load, he's doing response, but really what matters is what their company does is let's change how people do things in the sense of saying, do it differently so you don't screw it up the next time. That's preemption, not response. <clears throat> so when I say no driving cross country, draw a map, pick the site, set it out, drive a stake, do whatever, figure out where they're going at the first part of the equation, that matters a lot. And secondly, before they're doing Keith's other picture, probably what you ought to do is get a soil test done. Not you, the landowner. Have the company who's going to drill it, who's going to do it, come and check what's the depth of your topsoil, what's the depth of your organics, what's the slope, what's the contour, where does it drain. And Keith could tell you a lot more of the science, but look at his red picture on the left. You can see very plainly the difference between the organics, i.e. the topsoil line, versus the non-topsoil hyphen clay, silty loams, whatever, under it. I don't know. One produces grass, one does not. And ask our agronomist question, look, Micah, if you were going to do it, you know what grows the stuff and what doesn't, and you could distinguish just on the picture what should be growing plants and what shouldn't, right? That's why it's worth so much to do this on the front end instead of on the back end. So do the soil test. Figure it out, get a map, probe it, and then draw a contour map as well. Because Keith's comment to me yesterday is, yeah, if it's draining south today, when we reclaim it, we don't want to end up with it draining north. It affects your stock tanks, it affects your erosion, it affects your fisheries, it affects the willows, the riparian sites downstream. You change the direction. The whole thing you're looking at changes a bunch. And unless he's got a frontline survey that says this is what it did, this is where it was, putting back what was there, take a look at the picture. Tell me where the contours were in front of that earth mover on the lower left question if you didn't have a front end survey. Where did it drain? Where were the pockets? And that would be a ton of money to reclaim, I assume, wouldn't it, Keith? It is, yeah. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, the points that Wally brought up there, Stockpoil, uh, topsoil being stockpiled, you don't want a company coming in and just building the road on top of your topsoil. It needs to be stockpiled. What are your stormwater management plans? Which is the law, you have to have a stormwater management plan whenever you're disturbing more than one acre of ground. Now, on these locations, berms are built around them and no water is allowed to leave location, period. Which can affect the runoff in your watershed, but while the location's there, that's the way they're built. So when it rains and when it snows, we go out and suck mud puddles up at two seventy-five an hour. That's Whatever not two dollars and seventy-five cents an hour. <laughs> just so it's clear. That's two guys sucking. We love spring because we have multiple trucks out sucking water. <laughs> anyway, uh, anything that's dripped <laughs> off your trucks. We have a truck in Houston now. We have a truck that just left Oklahoma. They're coming home. They could have been in muddy conditions. They're packing the seeds, you know. So those things have to be considered. Migration corridors, which can be right with your cattle too. How are we going to manage our cattle now? Are they just going to be open range on the roads? Uh, noise pollution. Once this starts, you have noise tw 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How's that going to affect your livestock? A study came out in uh, Wyoming Roundup, what was it last week? It was talking about noise pollution with sage chickens and how it affects them. So things to consider. So ask the question, what is the status of the road? Is the access not just to that pad, to all the pads, or that you're going to use to drill something to core it, is that a permanent road or a temporary road? Question one, what are we going to build? Two, besides that, is it going to be improved for all weather use, or is it going to be a road that we sink up to the axles and we quit driving ahead and the tires are the size of the drums underneath the pickup? Because they can't turn anymore because they're stuck inside the fender wells. So what's the road, how it's going to be built, and the other bigger question is, can I use it? 
I'm the owner, I ranch here, can I use that road, are you gonna have that road just for your guys, your drilling rig, your crews in and out, your whatever else? What road, how long, temporary, permanent, whose use, what it is? And all those slopes, two and a half to one, is a really good angle per the SWEP program, which is the stormwater evaluation program, et cetera. Those are good and replanted. And if what you have there, if you wanna ruin Micah's day, Make sure the guy who does reclamation puts that nice icky red dirt on all the stuff to plant the next crop in and takes the topsoil and seals it and sells it in Denver to somebody for 80 bucks a cubic yard. And that's what people were doing for a while in eastern Montana and parts of Idaho. What they do is when they were doing a test site, they'd load up all the topsoil and what they were doing is not stockpiling it for reclamation. They were sticking it in big 10 yard dumps and hauling it to Salt Lake City for the Olympics. That's how we got green grass. Come back home, you want to restore your drilling site, fix your road, what do you have to plant grass seed in? What you have is rocks and glacial cobble. It doesn't reclaim one bet. So on the front end, figure out the road, what it is, ask the question. And we talked about the drainage issue of angle and slope and similar slopes for the, for the pad. When the drilling pad goes in, stockpile the dirt, stockpile the slope to be just right, reclaim it, replant it and there you go. So you're not gonna have this position of key skies have to be out there for huge money solving it. And more than that, do you guys actually wanna have all that other equipment out there driving around all spring, all fall, all during the spring melt off during this convention when we have the temperature so warm and the ground's frozen and the water goes, you want everybody out there having to do that. It's a wreck, so you don't. And then fences are the bigger question. Do you want them on that pad with all that stuff around so two questions. A, if the drilling company doesn't want your cows around, because in the winter, if they hear a tractor or a diesel, you know what the speed they come at is? It's fast. There's gonna be something yummy, let's go. Guess what? On a fine February 1st day, do you want your cows in the middle of that drilling pad? With all the equipment, all the noise, all the crap, all the stuff, probably not. These pits too are full of uh, toxic chemicals when you're done. I mean, there's gas, oil, water, so you don't want them drinking out of those. Those are usually fenced so tight, no wildlife. As a matter of fact, fines for birds dying in those are in the hundreds of thousands for one bird. So there's bird nets over them. Just things to consider. Most companies have gone away from this. They don't even do it anymore at all. They contain know, so. the pit now like in a tank or something. Yeah, they, they don't even dig pits. It's all contained, but uh, fences are to fence out, you want nothing to enter in those locations. But the other part is, we know what the problem child in the West is. It's everybody's cows. We hear it all the time. It's our cows, it's our sheep. I lost two cows last year to sage chicken bones stuck crossways in their throat. Because they eat so many sage hens and that killed them. It really bummed me out. <laughs> if I could just get them to swallow feathers quicker, nobody would see the evidence, you know. But anyway, the problem is cows are the target. So if you fence it to be totally cattle proof, the other requirement we put in the checklist is I want the fences wildlife friendly. I don't want people to bitch and say you screwed up the sage chickens hitting the mesh, that's why they got killed by all the coyotes, all the wolves, all the grizzly bears. I don't want antelope hanging upside down that defender sees. I don't want elk that can't migrate. I want to be able to say, we did fence it, we needed to, we fenced the whole road, fine. But it was wildlife friendly and it met my specs as the property owner. So if it's your place, it meets your specs, your requirement, that's what needs to be in the deal on the front end. The deal is they're gonna fence it fine, it's their bill, and if you don't like their fence contractor, also write into the agreement, and look, if you can't find a fence contractor, you can pay me to fence it. And my crew, my boy's away at college when he's home for spring break, we'll fence it, we'll build it right, and pay us to do it. Fine and dandy. The oil company, the wind tower company, the cell tower company is just as happy. Then what you have is the fence you need, you want, built to the specs you'd like it at. It's wildlife friendly and nobody can complain. So it's also a chance to make some other off the ranch revenue on the ranch for somebody who's doing what they're doing that way or the other way. So it's a very real issue. On the front end, not at the back end, because once it looks like that, fencing it then is a real bummer. One of the main fences I see go in on private property, and some of you may have worked in the industry too, and seen different things, but it's the guard fence. When you're entering the private property, most of the time there's an electronic gate. They set up a station right there, and it's usually fam family members that have been hired or friends of the family to allow people to come and go off of their property. 
And if we're uh, if the speed limit is 25 and we're doing 35, guess what? Mike's oil fields out the door. We don't want them back. They can't cross our property anymore. So, landowners have a huge say in what happens. Don't be afraid to take it. That's the message: is you're basically preempting, not responding. So really, the reason we gave you the outline and Keith's presentation is targeted for this. This is targeted for the question of before you have a wreck, how do we deal with it? And that's the best part. And before you have the wreck, have plans in place. Spills, they're going to happen. What's the response plan? Make sure you can look at the company's response plan, whether they're bringing in a cell tower, one of the trucks has a hydraulic leak, are they going to leave it for you to clean up later? Or do they have a response plan? Traffic to and from the rig, uh, a lot of the companies will hire buses anymore to bus people in and out. You can restrict that traffic and say, hey, I only want 10 trucks per day coming unless, unless you talk to me earlier, let me know that you're moving the rig or whatever. Air pollution, noise pollution, and again, waste management and the safety. Uh, where's your house sitting in relation to this rig? Are they drilling after H2S where one breath will kill you? What are you going to do if there's a blowout and you're in the kill zone? Do they have a plan in place? Is there an alarm system in place? Uh, those kind of things, um, when they start penetrating the ground, you don't know what they're going to hit. They hit gas pockets and they can't contain the well. Maybe it's in the surface. They haven't cemented yet. There'll be fires. There'll be escaped gases. So all of those things should be considered. So part of that equation is other simple things. If you can flip us back to the dirt picture about three slides. There we go. So the other thing on the dirt thing that matters is the stuff that we see a lot when Keith tells you he's got trucks today in Houston, Douglas, they were in Oklahoma last week. I don't know where else they are this week for you guys. But you know what's on the bottom of them. You know what they picked up. They're out doing stuff like this, checking a site, driving through it. And if you don't have a weed plan on the front end of the equation that says wash your vehicles before you bring them on and more than vehicles, wash your equipment. Look at that earth mover. If it came from Texas, God knows what it's carrying on the dirt on the frame. If it came from Oklahoma, you got seven more things. And it could have been on four jobs in five states in the last six weeks, and now it's on yours. And if you get a good rainstorm on a nice spring day, where does all the dirt and all the seeds fall off? So have a Tordon day, as we say in the napweed world, or have a 2,4-D day. Because the problem is who's stuck with seeds for the next 30 years, 8,000 per plant, just happens to be you. Not where you want to be. So the weed plant on the front end, and as well, if there's a spoils pile after the road's moved, this is a great mystery to me. When you move all that dirt and you build a road, you have all the topsoil sale, saved, there may be a spoils pile from the pad, from whatever, because they put other material on that's firmer or gravel. So what do you do with the extra dirt? That's a spoils pile. And the way I first plugged into that is, somebody said this was the case and I thought, you're crazy. Go out, take a post hole auger and auger a post hole. Lift the auger out, then take the dirt and start pulling it back in the hole with no post in the hole, and can you get all the dirt back in? You can't. It's really hard to do. It depends. I think when you do play soil, you're looking for dirt, right? <laughs> yeah, you are. But a lot of <laughs> times it's soil. like it blew up. It expands. So how do we stuff it all back in the hole? Until it gets wet. Until it's later. wet. Yeah, so the problem is if they're going to have a spoils pile, what do we do with it? And the spoils plan is they can sell it and haul it away, or the plan is you need it for your front yard to raise the place you want to build a new swimming pool or a deck with all the oil money you've got now or whatever. Fine. Or you need it for another road to fill up a bank or whatever. I don't care. But have a plan for the spoils pile. Because if there is extra stuff, it needs to be reclaimed. It needs to be hauled away. It needs to be graded down. And this is a tremendous disturbance for a small area, relatively speaking. So take a ranch of like 3,000 acres and do that twice on it. That's a huge amount of disruption on six sections of ground. It's an opportunity for you to uh, get projects done too if you need culverts put in somewhere, whether it's on this roadway or on a pond, uh, ditches cleaned, ponds dug. It's a great opportunity to include that in the contracts. I know we've always done weeks and weeks of side work, digging ponds, putting head gates in, rebuilding miles and miles of ditches, new irrigation lines. 
And uh, that's the fun stuff for us. So. Or sometimes you'll find out the truth is companies do not have a budget to buy you better roads. Companies don't have a budget to build you better fences. Companies don't have a budget to say we'll pay you greater than one-eighth of the royalty for the oil or the gas or more than $400 a month for a cell tower. But what companies always have is what I call the budget for stuff. This is the genetic problem men have. We're protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act because we have an XY chromosome instead of an XX. So that little part that was missing that made the Y is why we always save things, we have a garage full of stuff, we're always accumulating things at auctions and whatever else because we're looking for the missing part. So what's nice about companies is they have a budget for stuff. So if you need three extra trees, if you need the culverts put in, if you need a better drain system put in, if you need your irrigation sick, fixed, they have a budget to do that. They don't have a budget a lot of times to pay for the other things. So mull it through big time. It may be a really good opportunity to, quote, improve the quality of your stuff. So it's the stuff budget. And get with it, because that's well worth taking a hard look at as you do the thing. No weed plant on the front end means you're going to have a huge wreck later putting up with what that did. If the wrong stuff, the wrong plants, the wrong seeds, the wrong weeds fall off all of that. Here's the irony. The knapweed infestation in southwest Montana was not there until 1993. And it got there due to a project by the National Resources Conservation Service and the state of Montana DNRC and the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to build, quote, a fish-friendly diversion structure for use in rivers. They did a prototype, they engineered it, and they called an environmental construction company to come and build the site, and they did, and the company didn't wash its stuff. It was from western Montana. And what was no knapweed over an entire place is now knapweed on about 40,000 acres. 8,000 seeds per plant, 10 years dormant in the ground, and they bloom twice a year in that climate. All they had to do all those years ago, nearly 20 now, is say, wash your stuff when you bring it so that we don't have all this weed base on a bulldozer, an excavator, and two pickups. And they didn't do it. And they should have. And we wish they would have. So frankly, it's not that hard to do this, and it's a reasonable thing to ask, but who knows how to do it on the ground is you guys, because you are where the rubber hits the road. That's reality. <coughs> Great. So going. drilling risks we went over, uh, well completions. This is the, the big controversy. Same things though, spills. How do we contain them? How do we manage them? Traffic to and from the, the pad, air pollution, noise pollution, waste management. The big thing here is the fracks and the groundwater. So when a well is drilled, there's cement encased on the first 1,800 to 2,000 feet at the top to try to protect all of the groundwater. Uh, the concern is what if that leaks? Fracking in our country is taking place between 16 and 18,000 feet. Most of the groundwater is up less than 200 feet to the surface. And so we have no recorded cases of it, but Pennsylvania, Pavilion, Wyoming, there's been some cases, so there are some concerns there. You definitely don't want to have your waters contaminated. You go over into Buffalo and Sheridan in that country with the coal bed methane. They're pumping out way more water than they are gas and that water's got to go somewhere and a lot of it has a high salinity. pH isn't conducive for growing crops. So you see all this water and you're thinking great look at all this water I can irrigate with and you spread it on your fields and now your fields are dead and you've ruined them and so just different things to consider. Production would be kind of the last phase before reclamation. Production simply just producing it, getting it to market, to sell to the rest of us, to use for natural gas in our homes, oil, diesel, gasoline, those, pro those products that we all use and take for granted. And it takes a lot of pipelines, takes a lot of storage tanks. Um, they've started adding, the companies have started adding these units to help clean the air out in our country. But <clears throat> all of that infrastructure is going to be there 50, 60, 70 years. So what color do you want the tanks um, to match your environment? What about uh, the pads? How much are you going to reclaim? How much traffic are you going to let in and out? You know, some places are so remote they ran off of computers. Nobody goes to them unless there's a problem. Um, a lot of them are getting to be pretty sophisticated. 
So production risk, you know, this is the long-term scenario. Again, your spill containment, and around these tanks, there's berms that are built around them to hold all of the material that if the tanks were to completely empty, the berms would hold everything. So that's just kind of a standard. Again, your traffic, your waste management, where's the pipeline going, what's the, the reseeding reclamation methods, which we'll get into here in just a moment. And again, back to your pollution of your air, water, soil. So reclamation, in our country, it's tough because we live in a very brittle environment. Uh, Wyoming in general is very brittle. It's tough to get things to grow. And what's happened, our oil companies have actually piped water out, set up sprinklers just to try to get crops to take off. Sometimes they'll reseed something, it'll be two or three years and still nothing has sprouted. They plant in the fall, they plant in the spring, and the only thing that comes up are tumbleweeds. And so they've tried different things. They'll lay wooden mats out over the sagebrush and use those for roads to the locations. And that's been pretty effective. When the pads are pulled back, the sagebrush is obviously dead, but at least the grass grows back. And a lot of times when reclamation does take off, it is, uh, it's better than what the old was due to the fact that the old had reached a climax community. It was too mature, too woody. So once they can actually get the crops or the, the grasses and the forbs and everything to grow, it is a better environment for wildlife. Now this bottom picture is on uh, New Fork River. That's on the Jensen place over there. These wells are the Jensen pads and uh, the Bibles. So private property, you can see the cattle there. You can see the wetlands. The company that we work for that actually has done the drilling down here, not one drop will leave your truck if, if your pickups drip in oil when you enter that site, you'll be escorted off location and you will pay for the cleanup. Now, this is all private and they're going the extra mile. Every drop they bring out of the ground actually goes away to a different disposal pit. There are silt fences all over the place uh, to protect the wetlands. Uh, cattle out there, we hydrovac a hole one day. Uh, Hydrovacking is a process, by the way, where we dig with water and you vacuum the dirt up into a large truck. And we dug a hole exposing a pipeline and we put silt fence, not silt fence, but the orange fence around it for the night. Came back the next morning and there's a cow dead in it. So um, things do happen. That cow cost us a lot more money than if we'd have got if we'd have just went to Riverton, you know. Um, Plus it put a black mark against us in the industry. So fencing is done a little differently at this time. This is a process, uh, this was down in Evanston, Wyoming on the Carpenter 1A locations. This is a family ranch. Here we dug ponds, we put in culverts for the guy. Anyway, this ranch had changed hands three times. The current owner had some tests run on some well water and found out that his water was contaminated with hydrocarbons. So over the course of several years, more testing was done. The reserve pit was leaking out into the groundwater. So on this location, we end up going down and digging out 86,000 yards of material. We ran them through that machine, which 86,000 yards would be about 8,600 end dump loads. Dug it out, pumped out all of the groundwater, just kept it coming until we had clean water. Ran the groundwater into tanks treated them through a filter and chemical process, cleaned the groundwater. All of this soil was ran through a screen machine where we added an oxidizer to convert the hydrocarbons to water, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. And then we replaced the soil back into the earth. And now the rancher has a clean environment. This was the oil company that paid for it, but what if you didn't have the bonds in place? What if you didn't have the money in place to, to fix something like that? These were wells that were drilled back in the 70s. So it could have very easily been passed on to the landowner. But everything was in place. This was a very expensive project. He's clean now. Um, all the topsoil was stockpiled. There was three foot on top that we pulled back and placed back on the top when we were finished. The only thing that we lack is the reseeding in the spring, and as Wally's mentioned several times, he didn't want us to do it. He wanted to do it himself for quality control to make sure he's getting what he wants. So just an example of something that would pretty much break a rancher if you had to go fix that, you know. So reclamation considerations, again, you're gonna have waste. Where does it go? How do we manage the weeds? 
how many years are you going to have the oil and gas company coming back in spraying weeds or, or are you going to manage them yourself what's the slope are we going back to original has it changed are you uh, agreeable with the change for the watershed and the effects on the watershed how's reseeding going to occur what type of fencing what stays disturbed if we need to access these locations how much are you going to leave just enough for a pickup to come and go enough for semis who pays for reclamation and <clears throat> other items there that you guys can think of for reclamation that uh, how many of you have had experience with oil and gas and cell towers development on your places a little bit have, are we hitting it have you seen some of these things That's a good side business for a farmer slash rancher. I know all the guys down in Big Piney that are the biggest hay producers are also the guys out there reseeding and they're the ones getting it done right, you know. That's who the oil and gas companies hire, so. But you know, uh, our world is a challenging place. We've got an energy crisis. We have uh, third world countries that are accelerating to the point of wanting to use energy on the same level as as what we're using it so the problem's not going to go away we need to find more domestic energy resources and a lot of that's going to happen on private grounds as bob was showing us this morning we kind of have an economic crisis going uh, we have a climate crisis whether or not global warming is occurring because of hydrocarbons doesn't matter it's changing um, so we have all these things to consider and we have to view the whole picture as a whole. How are, how are we going to uh, treat all of these different crises? There are no monocultures. We need to have diversity in all things. We need to look at the whole rather than just the parts and the pieces. And this uh, presentation has some stuff from one that I did for Wally in his environmental class. So I do mention environmental laws. And I'll just quickly say they help to guide the companies to do it right. Now, the companies that I've worked for, if we're going to private, it's pristine. We're working down in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, working on a location that's going to be drilled. And when we go out there, there's people sitting on the corner, get the frack out of here. And, you know, there's all sorts of protests. And, and here we are with the big old MOS, Mike's Oil Field side on the side. And I was an environmental science teacher. I'm trying to do things right and play a positive part in, in all of this. However, uh, you know, the perception towards us is very poor. So, out here at Steamboat Springs, private property, everything that we take out there has to be spotless. It has to be freshly painted. You know, the oil company wants to shine. They want it to look, the appearance to be as if we care, which we do. Private landowners get more attention than, than public by a long shot, from my experience. Why would they want to do it right, the oil and gas companies? What's in it for them? You know, if they, if they hit a big pocket of energy, how long are they going to be working off of one well? Could be 50 or 60 years, right? They'll be there a long time, and what if we're developing your place and we do a, a poor job, and I want to go develop on your place? It's not going to happen, so, so they try to, uh, to do everything as proper and the best that they can to their ability, because they want to be in it, they are in it for the long haul, and they want to be able to work on your place and your place and overseas and wherever they need to in order to get the oil and gas so and you know that's what I do mainly here that's where my heart is <laughs> but I do have to go uh, like I say work another job to make all of that happen unfortunately so all right Wally wrap it up there in Montana we have to work four other jobs to have it make it happen <laughs> because we didn't have oil and gas revenues in Montana like you guys Actually, so the reality of the thing, though, is those of you who've done it, your point is really well taken. There's a lot of time with people coming back to fix it, to do it better, to whatever. The point, though, really is it's fine to do that as long as somebody has a budget. It's not too out of control. You can still find the guys who did the work. You can do whatever else. The problem we often have is there isn't enough money or you can't find the persons or the problem is way out of control. There's too much weed already, there's too much discharge, it washed out stuff. You guys want to screw up an irrigation pump, run a bunch of silica clay through your pump for a whole summer. It's amazing what it does to a bronze impeller. It's fabulous how you can just see that thing so shiny, so nice, it's just half not pear. Little detail, don't worry. So the deal, frankly, for all of you is the more you're preemptive, the better you are. 
You can do a bond, you can have them give you a deposit, you can have them pay you up front to do it, you can whatever. There's a whole lot of different mechanisms you have in Wyoming under the law to do it. You need to talk to whoever about it, but the real issues in the agreement is not how do you insure the money. That's your state law, an attorney, whatever else figures that out for each state you're in. The reality of the equation is talk about those issues on the front end of the deal. So the last two pages I gave you are just a simple set of addendums to a 40 paragraph lease agreement that was done for a cell tower site. And what we put on it is we didn't want them screwing around with anything, not just wells, we put ore springs because we use stock water springs. We have a whole number of pipelines from our springs that are 10 or 12 or 14 miles long. Multiple, multiple gravity fed tanks off those. If they botch the spring, we don't lose that spring only. We lose the water tanks for 14 miles of pipe. That's a lot of ground. So when we say, don't butcher our wells, don't give us a problem, the reason we're saying don't give us a spring problem is we don't want it done. We don't want to have a problem because it fouls it all up, and then we don't have enough budget as well to go out and drill a new well to feed that spring system anyway. So the cost was not just having the spring, the cost was we have a 10 mile or a 14 mile pipe on it. Now if we have no spring, we have a 14 mile pipe, what do you do with it? It's kind of useless, unless you have water, and on top of that, the last free thing in the world from a Scotsman is gravity. So who wants to drill a well, put in the power, and pump the water, and pay the electric bill every year from now on to have all those cows water on 14 miles of pipe? Don't want to do it. So it's a significant question to say they will not do that. And if they do that, no repair and area stuff. If they mess it up, they have to fix it. We want the money, we want a guarantee. The same with the weed thing is an issue. As well, the fencing thing is a question outlined in there. The other big one is a new one. The other thing we put in all the leases we've done lately says, if you're gonna drill it, fine, if you're gonna develop it, but if you don't use it, or you have two holes you don't use, we want the ability to use the holes to sequester carbon. Check the cap and trade exchange in the, on the German cap and trade, the carbon exchange today. It's worth a lot of money. Now in California, you can buy carbon credits from one generator, close that one down, and take it to another generator and keep burning coal. So carbon credits are worth a lot. So if ranchers can sequester carbon, why isn't it, if there's a way to do it on this site, that we can't sequester carbon at a subsequent time, store it there, and somebody will pay us to do it? Which is fabulous. So we've been putting in all the agreements for oil, gas, that we can sequester if we need to as well for cell towers and wind towers. The other two things are this. One, they want an easement because FAA regs require that on a lot of those things. My thought is, wait a second, look at the page. It says, if you quit using it, we want it to go away. I don't want an easement for a cell tower on my property for eternity. I want you to give it back. So put in the agreement that at the point in time the use ceases, they have to convey it back to you so you don't always have this encumbrance on your property for a roadway, a driveway, a, sad, a pad for a well, a pad for a tower, a pad for a wind gen, whatever. Make sure it says we're going to get rid of it at that point in time. Other practical things we put on there like how deep does that pipeline go? It's not so hard across a piece of sagebrush field like that, they'll get it deep enough. But if you have that as a grain field, how deep is the pipe going to be so you don't hit it with a ripper, you don't hit it with a chisel plow, you don't hit it with a disc, you don't hit it with whatever? Some of the weirder parts are these. There are places I've been where the temperature of the oil going through the line is warm. So guess what you have all winter? You have a long open road across your field. Because the heat's coming out of the pipe in the ground, coming up and melting a green strip. Where does it green up first in the spring? <laughs> right on that. What's the last place to turn brown in the fall? That strip. So there's other considerations you can look at too. So if they've got a reputation for temperature material of that type and you don't want these little stripes across your whole place that are melted stuff, melted snow, whatever, fine, right in there. They'll insulate the pipes that are in the ground or what's the depth going to be. So we just gave you a template or these are some ideas. How long do you have? Where do they go? What do they do it? And if they need other lands to do it, fine, we'll negotiate a deal for other lands to accomplish your goals, like they got to park Keith's truck somewhere else, their pad isn't big enough, fine, we'll make a deal with you. That's great. In the wintertime when they're drilling, you know what they need from a lot of you? 
If you're going to run a diesel a long time, you never unplug it if it's not running. And so what they'll do is call you and say, look, you have a barn sitting over there. Can we have four plug-ins outside to plug in four trucks every day? You bet. And they'll pay you to do it. Because they know it's a whole lot easier to plug in that engine and start it every morning than it is to start it cold off ether or God knows what and wear their engine out in six weeks. So there's a whole lot of other parameters of what can you do as the property owner to help those guys accomplish what you want to do. Revenue from wind towers, revenue from cell towers, revenue from oil and gas, it doesn't matter. But it needs to have something in it for everybody. And if it doesn't, and too often in the past it didn't, it's really hard to have to go back and get it right. It's better to not have to have them come back. And the nice part is you're young enough you can remember it. The worst part is, is when you're 60, it would be really hard to have them come back and fix it right then. That's 30 or 40 more years. And you know what? Who remembers it? Who had it right? What was the contour? How did the drain work? Where were the silt fences? Where was the pipe? Where was the building? Who's going to remember? So that's why I draw the map, do the soil test, and if you have a question, don't just talk to the lawyer or the whoever's working on it for you. Find yourself Keith Hughes or somebody like him. Because when he's seen the worst, he knows what the wreck is. Or talk to your neighbor who had a really bad experience, like the guy down at Gillette or wherever those pictures were. Talk to them about what went wrong. And their experience with what was messed up is worth a whole lot more than somebody telling you, write this down to say they won't pollute it. Well, they did. So find somebody who had to clean it up first and figure out how to do it that way. So what you've got is a checklist from Keith of the different parts and a checklist that I put together with it of this is what should go in. These are the things to think about at a minimum. And it doesn't have to be big, big lawyer ease language. When you look at that third page, during operations at least semi-annually, lessee will regrade and reseed areas disturbed to facilitate control of sediments or runoff discharges and dust at the premises. That is not lawyer ease. That is simple English. An eighth grader could write that, read it, and it makes sense. That's how it ought to be. I subscribe completely to the KISS rule. Keep it simple, stupid. And it works great. So all of you in your kitchen can sit down and pencil it out. And if you don't know, ask somebody else. But for the most part, the outline of how this all works, any of you can do. That's why I gave you a template. And that's why Keith's language is just as good in terms of keep it simple and do it right. What kind of questions do you have? Comments, thoughts? I'm used to cold fingers by now, trying to get these trucks started. I'm not used to being inside. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, you guys are hearing rumblings of carbon sequestration talks in terms of, I mean, can we think about carbon sequestration in these same terms? Yep, you can and you should, exactly, yep. If you have wells that are drilled, though, you you're going to have to go a lot further and study the geological formation. Can you accept carbon? Right now, uh, Denbury, working out west of Big Piney, is drilling hydrogen sulfide and they're taking the carbon off of it and actually pumping it to North Dakota. And so there's a pipeline crossing the whole state of Wyoming and heading north to North Dakota. It'll be online here within probably 8 or 10, 12 months. And that's to be pushed into the ground to lift the oil out of the ground better. So solving a couple of things, sequestering carbon, but also helping to lift the oil out of the ground. So, so carbon dioxide is becoming a very valuable resource. So the carbon sequestration you guys are referring to is really pushing it into the geologic material. I believe that's what Wally was. I think you guys have the potential of sequestering it through carbon, through, through plants. Yeah, more so. Matter. Organic matter, yeah. You go out and get all your measurement. And yeah. so all, but all of those. But regardless, here's the thing. The carbon exchange in Germany started in 1992. Headwaters RC&D was the first RC&D in the country to start brokering carbon on the German carbon exchange then, which was a really radical deal. It was really stupid. A bunch of guys said it's a bunch of greenies from the solar chase. You guys are nuts. I got this from all your faculty the last two days. That's okay. But it was. But you know what? It is huge money by the ton if you can sequester it. And the Europeans are way ahead of us. So quest sequestering is in the form of, did you plant more crops this year that have more vegetative matter and you turn them under? That's sequestering carbon. Do you leave trees grow? Now you can make carbon sequestration growing trees in Europe because the trees tie up the carbon by the ton as they grow up. 
So the radical things are like use an old oil well. If you're sealed up enough, fine. Pump a whole bunch of carbon down in the ground and pressurize it. And they will pay you by the ton to put it in the ground and get rid of it and seal the well up. So there's a huge exchange that does it. In cap and trade now, I talked to Bob Brown this morning, there was legislation proposed and it was worked out by NRCS about three years ago. And they've got it done and California's trading it and doing lots of it. Now there's talk of the cap and trade bill coming back to the Congress to encourage it nationally more. And if they do it, the whole worth of those dry holes, so to speak, or an old well you've got or whatever, is worth a whole lot more. But remember the same problem. Instead of regulating how somebody takes the stuff away from you, now they're going to bring it to you. So the same rules apply. They build a new road, if they have new trucks from other places, if they whatever else, all the concerns Keith talking about apply in mine too. Grade, reclamation, weeds, water discharge, reseeding, all of it applies. But at the same time, there's two ways to make money then, which is a bizarre deal. You can pump the oil out of the ground and sell it and get a revenue or you can pump carbon back in the ground and get paid to do it and get a revenue. And I never thought I'd be looking at two sides of that in law school 30 years ago, but there are two sides to it now. So that's something that ought to be part of the agreement if it's doable, for sure. There's uh, another program that I read about in the Roundup last week. <laughs> Sublet County started uh, an exchange where oil companies will come and either buy out a ranch or buy for you to preserve what you have because of what they've destroyed elsewhere. So there's lots of opportunities for landowners. This is trading carbon. Not very. No, you might be more familiar. I just read the article in there. I haven't talked to the, the uh, conservation group. Some are, some aren't. It depends. It, it depends on how they're doing it. This is the same with trading sulfur dioxide. In the days when we had paper mills, etc., people did industry, you could close one plant down, clean up two plants halfway, but if the net pounds you saved closing that one down was less than these two polluting, you could keep running these two plants. So you were trading basically the ability to pollute. They do the same thing with water discharge, TMDL, total amount of nitrate, nitrate out of a sewage treatment plant, whatever you can do that. So what they're doing is the same thing with land, with property. So they're saying we screwed this one up, it's a mess, let's set this one aside, do some reclamation, they'll never do it right, let's go over here, buy this ranch, do it, manage it for agriculture, fine. But there's a separate conversation to have there. And this is one that has some people not very happy, but I finally got them to pick it up a couple weeks ago. I don't care if you preserve land with a conservation easement or not. Do not think for one second that preserves agriculture. It's not agricultural land unless you do agriculture. So the key of that exchange program is what you need to do is bum the language of the Muscle Shell Planning Project stuffed on a bunch of conservation easements. We were doing 400,000 acres a month three years ago of conservation easements. 400,000 acres a month in. That's what we did in like three, a three month period, 400,000 each month. But the language says, if the owner doesn't do agriculture, the property has to be made available for agricultural production by other producers at market price for ag. So the focus is not save the land. The focus is save the land, but save the opportunity. That's the key. So the reason reclamation is so important that Keith's talking about, the reason weeds matter so much, is not having those weeds is preserving our opportunity. That's really the message Keith and I believe in probably more than anything. Totally different educations, totally different ends of the rules, but the message is the same. This is about how do we preserve the opportunity to do what all of you love to do, what we love to do, and not screw it up. So preserve opportunity. And that's why reclamation, weed management, water quality, exchange of land that way with the trading program for an oil company is fine, but when they do it, on the new piece of ground should be a paragraph that says, if the owner of that land is not producing agricultural products, they will make it available for agricultural production at market price for agriculture with best management practices. If you think I'm kidding, how many grazing permits in Wyoming don't exist now? 
How many exist now that are half the size they were 20 years ago? I got ads in the paper all over Missoula County, or Beaverhead County, Madison County, want grass for 2,000 yearlings, we'll do in any one of nine western states. It's not there because the opportunity got closed down with closed federal ground, bad oil and gas projects that shut it down, butchered things, conservation easements that don't provide agriculture. I have a 10,000 acre ranch and I hate cows. So I conserved it to save agricultural land, but I'm not raising cows. So guess what? It isn't agricultural land unless we do the practice, process, procedure, science, and art. Every one of you who rides, every one of you who ropes, every one of you who bales, everybody who farms a field, everybody who does all of those things, everybody who doctors a calf, that shears a sheep, that is not just the practice, process, procedure, and science of raising food or fiber. That is an art. And that is what the whole issue of opportunity is about. And if you butcher it by screwing up reclamation, by ruining the water quality, by having a spill that doesn't get fixed, what we've taken away is our opportunity, and what that's killing is our art. That's a huge issue. It'll be interesting to see how this mitigation works. You know, if you want to go be an agriculture producer, it's going to be tough to compete with these oil and gas companies trying to, to buy up properties. I'm hoping they treat it more as conservation of agriculture, but the focus is so much on sage grouse, deer migration corridors, antelope, it'd be real easy to lose that agriculture base. If we're but it's careful. only conservation of agriculture if you mandate the opportunity. Then if one of us wants to lease it, we can. I didn't say they have to do agriculture, because I'm not going to say they have to do X with their land, but if we're going to save the opportunity, somebody will step up and lease it for grass, somebody will raise the hay, somebody will plant it, somebody will raise Christmas trees, I don't care. There's enough demand for the product, there's enough young people who want to do it, somebody will lease it. So if we're going to really provide agriculture, ensure the opportunity at market price for ag. And that solves it right there. That is a radical idea.